So my understanding is that uh, this is a seminar series that's leading up to next year's uh, uh, Henri Pancare series in Paris, uh, and that uh, the well, the aim is to. Uh, promote conversation between clinicians and neuroscientists and mathematicians so that we can exchange information from the clinic and the laboratory to the mathematicians and the mathematicians can uh, uh, well uh, develop models of the processes that we're dealing with and indeed then inform us in a way that might help us to improve the, the care of patients so that's what i'm understanding is the purpose uh, although in fact when uh, 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 Claudia was introducing me she said i had a phd in physics that's true but that was over 15 so 50 over 50 years ago half a century ago and so uh, although i once knew a lot of physics so uh, well uh, i guess i've forgotten a lot of physics as well uh, but nonetheless uh, i guess uh, that is where if you like my scientific career started but definitely i'm very much a clinician now interested in clinical uh, questions. So uh, one of the big clinical questions that we face in serious mental illness is improving the outcome of the illness schizophrenia. Uh, now, as you no doubt know, you know schizophrenia has a, a, a variety of symptoms. Probably the, if you like, the best known are the delusions and the hallucinations. They're the sort of distortions of reality. Uh, but there's also uh, in, well, in severe schizophrenia, there is a serious problem with the disorganization of mental activity. That's disorganization of thinking, disorganization of mood, uh, disorganization of behavior. You know, disorganization of thinking, for example, leads to speech that is disconnected, where you tend to lose track of what the person is saying to you, what the patient might be saying to you, because it, you can't quite follow how the ideas have become disconnected from each other. And then uh, the other class of symptoms are so-called negative symptoms. But today I'm really going to focus on this disorganization of mental activity because uh, uh, disorganization early in the illness is one of the really strong predictors of poor long-term outcome. So you know, in schizophrenia, approximately half of the cases really have quite serious long-term problems with function in everyday life and indeed uh, well a, a lack of the ability to enjoy the the life that they would have wanted to have had uh, and uh, so you know about half of people suffer from these quite persistent disabilities and disorganization occurring early in the illness is a quite important predictor there have been longitudinal studies I've, at the bottom of this slide you'll see references to uh, a study by Dominguez which is a 10-year follow-up of young people and they were several thousand people recruited when they were well, when they were well, uh, and followed their subsequent uh, development of mental problems. And indeed, uh, disorganization predicted both the onset of, of delusions and hallucinations, but also poor long-term outcome. And then there was another uh, seven-year follow-up of people recruited early in the illness uh, by Zeeman's and colleagues. Uh, and uh, in that study, uh, they showed that disorganization at uh, initial recruitment in the very early stage of the illness was the strongest predictor of poor long-term outcome over seven years. So this disorganization is really important. And so the question that I'm wishing to address today is, is what is the mechanism of disorganization? What's going on in the mind and the brain when people uh, suffer from this disorganization? I'm going to be, uh, well, uh, addressing two hypotheses. Now, the first hypothesis is actually a very uh, well-known, long-standing hypothesis, uh, and that is the notion that predictive coding shapes perception and action. Now, this was originally pro uh, uh, proposed by uh, von Helmholtz uh, about 150 years ago. Uh, and indeed, in the past uh, few years, there's been a lot of focus of attention uh, among neuroscientists uh, in uh, understanding uh, how, well, what the mechanism of this predictive coding abnormality is. Uh, now, what do we mean by predictive coding? Well, uh, the, the a proposal is that the brain generates internal models of the world that are successively updated uh, in light of the sensory information that we receive from the external world. Uh, and uh, that what we actually perceive uh, when we receive sensory inf inf uh, information is actually determined by us making 
internally uh, uh, generated predictions and we adjust these predictions to minimize the discrepancy between what our brain is predicting and the actual uh, effects of the sensory input on our brain. Uh, those discrepancies, the difference between what we've predicted and what actually comes into our brain from the senses uh, is, uh, is what's called a prediction error. Uh, now, uh, th this and what I've just described is largely, if you like, how we perceive things. Uh, but also, of course, it's not just perception that is involved here, it's also action. So motor actions are controlled by a, a forward model uh, of what the state of our brain and body is going to be as we carry out the action. Our brain predicts what's going to happen and we continuously adjust uh, our action to minimize the discrepancies between what we're predicting and, and what actually happens. And this notion of predictive coding really allows for very uh, efficient, rapid processing of information during perception and action, because effectively we've already got some proposal from, a, you know, we've generated from within our own brain or our own mind what we're expecting. And all we do is continue to update that rather than to have to, if you like, build up uh, piece by piece an entire picture of the world uh, at every moment as we as we uh, receive information. So that's that's the predictive coding hypothesis. As I say, it's been, uh, it was proposed first of 150 years ago by von Helmholtz, uh, but has been uh, greatly, uh, well, greatly developed and uh, quite a lot of evidence has been assembled in, in recent years. Now, returning to the, the main question uh, of interest today uh, is the second hypothesis, namely that imprecise predictive coding is uh, the core mechanism of disorganization in schizophrenia. So that's the, the issue that we will largely focus on. Now, <clears throat> to give you some, well, if you like, a, a fairly straightforward manifest illustration of brain processes in predictive coding, uh, I'm uh, going to summarize uh, a phenomenon known as mismatch negativity. Uh, those of you who are familiar with electroencephalography will no doubt uh, uh, be well aware of that, but I, but, uh, well, I will describe it nonetheless. So the notion here is that an unexpected stimulus generates a, a negative electrical potential over the frontal and temporal uh, regions of the brain uh, that occurs about 200 milliseconds after this uh, uh, unexpected uh, stimulus. So, so we're receiving this uh, 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 stimulus, well I should point to the illustration, this is the negative stimulus uh, that is occurring about 200 milliseconds after the, the unexpected stimulus arrived. Uh, I'm illustrating here the unexpected stimulus as a regular series of, of tones, musical tones uh, of, of given duration, followed by a long duration uh, tone. And uh, the long duration tone is, you know, it's unexpected. We're expecting another one of these quavers and we get, and we get this, uh, this longer note. So uh, that's, uh, that's mismatch negativity. Now, uh, one reason for giving you this illustration is that uh, in recent times, people have uh, regarded this as, as a good, uh, uh, if you like, test situation for, for trying to model uh, predictive coding. And in particular, uh, Adams and colleagues, so I give the reference, well, outline the reference here at the bottom, uh, they used uh, the mathematical modeling known as dynamic causal modeling uh, applied both to EG data and also they've applied it to functional magnetic resonance imaging data, fMRI data, uh, in both patients and controls, uh, and they've adjusted the various parameters in their model. Now, the model consists of a uh, of local circuits. So these uh, blue neurons here, uh, there's superficial pyramidal cells, deep pyramidal cells, but then we've got uh, various interneurons, including these GABAergic inhibitory interneurons, and the various arrows uh, represent possible uh, 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 connections. We've also got spiny stellate cells, for example, and we've got a, a variety of different possible interactions. There are also, if you like, self interactions where a, a neuron can uh, uh, you know, uh, send feedback to itself via, uh, via an axon that, if you like, is recursive. Anyway, that's the, if you like, the standard 
local circuit that, that Adams uh, and colleagues fed into their model, but they also included long range connections. So here that this is representing the inferior frontal gyrus uh, and this is the superior temporal gyrus. As you can probably see this background here is a, a, a lateral view of the brain with the front here and the, the posterior area back here. So this is the inferior frontal gyrus, that's the superior top, temporal gyrus. And they also included, in fact, the auditory cortex, which is about where I'm pointing there on the, a little bit more lateral to these other uh, nodes. Uh, anyway, their model has local circuits represented by these connections uh, and then long range uh, uh, connections on both left and right hemisphere. And uh, uh, they put, parameters for all these connections in, into the or for most of these connections they did admit some of the you know some of them they considered were not plausible but they put in uh, models for these things also uh, external drive this is representing auditory information coming into the auditory cortex anyway they ran they conducted this model on real data from uh, patients and controls, and they concluded that there was a, a so-called decrease in synaptic gain in pyramidal cells. Now, I don't want to go into the details of, of what that is at the moment, but broadly speaking, synaptic gain is the ratio between the output of a pyramidal cell uh, divided by its input. And uh, so that's synaptic gain, and uh, they're concluding that, that was decreased in schizophrenia and responsible for uh, the deficit in mismatch negativity. So in the healthy people, we've got quite deep mismatch negativity in the schizophrenia patients and also in this study in their first degree relatives, uh, we've got a much reduced uh, 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 mismatch negativity. So that is an illustration of how one can model uh, uh, these predictive coding processes and draw conclusions about what's happening in the in the local circuits uh, in the uh, in in the well in the brain cortex here. Okay, now uh, I'm largely going to talk about oscillations uh, in this talk, uh, and uh, the there's uh, well a, a large amount of evidence accumulating. Uh, and we'll look at it, some of them today, that indicates that synchronous brain oscillations play a really cardinal role in the, the neural coding of predictions. It's, by examining the, the oscillatory activity in the brain, you can see something about the, the patterns of brain activity that are involved in, in coding these predictions that uh, are involved in predictive coding. Uh, the, there's, well, underlying this is the notion that if there are coherent fluctuations between, well, between different pools of neurons in the neural membrane potential, that facilitates coordinated recruitment of a, a brain network. So this is, if you like, the primary reason why, why oscillatory activity, uh, uh, which is going to give rise to coordinated or in-phase uh, changes in, in membrane potential will tend to lead to the coordinated recruitment of a brain network. Now, uh, a moderate amount of evidence, I mean, this is an oversimplification now, but a, a lot of evidence suggests that the very high frequency oscillations above 40 hertz, 40 cycles per second, uh, uh, reflect uh, actually, well, okay, in that region, even above 30, I guess probably most people would count as gamma. Anyway, high frequencies uh, reflect coordinated activity in local brain circuits, uh, whereas some of the lower frequencies, uh, including the beta oscillations, which is in the range of about 13, to 30 hertz uh, are involved in long range coordination of these internally generated predictions. Now, these two statements about gamma and beta are, are just simply generalizations. There's a lot more detail uh, uh, in terms of what both gamma and beta do uh, than I'm representing here. Right, so let's look at some, some data. Now, this is data uh, acquired by Judith Ford and her colleagues uh, uh, when, well, she was at Yale University at that time. I think she's now in California, but in those days, back in 2008, she was at Yale. Uh, and uh, so what uh, she and her colleagues did was uh, collected e EEG data during self-paced button pressing. So they simply asked the participants in their study to press a button uh, at a pace that they, well, the participants 
made this selection of when they pressed the button. They didn't get any cue to tell them when to press. They were just told, press it at approximately once every one or two seconds. So the participants were simply pressing a button at fair, you know, well, at, at periods of time separated by between a second and two seconds. And uh, what we're, I'm showing you here are the uh, patterns of an EEG activity um, time locked to the actual button press. So if we uh, focus just on, well, I'm going to focus on this particular panel here. Now this is uh, um, data acquired at the electrode that's known as FC3, uh, this is in the international, well, this is more or less actually, well, okay, the international uh, classification of uh, electrode sites. So it's frontocentral and three means it's on the left-hand side, just, well, a little bit, uh, not too far to space in the midline. And that region pretty well overlies an area just in front of the hand area of the motor cortex. So we're select, we're seeing here the electrical activity recorded from somewhere above the area, well, in the vicinity of the motor cortex, just a little bit anterior. Now, uh, the people were using their right hand to press the button. And as you know, of course, uh, it's your left hemisphere that controls the right hemisphere button press. So FC3 is going to be located over the area where we expect there'll be brain activity associated with button pressing. Now, the vertical line, black line here, represents the, uh, 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 the uh, a time at which the button press occurs. And the time scale here, you'll be able to see down the bottom, uh, uh, we're going from minus 100 milliseconds to plus 100 milliseconds relative to the black line. So this is a bit over 100 milliseconds or around 100 milliseconds uh, before the button press. We see this red blob. Now the red blob means an increase in uh, the synchrony of the oscillations. And this is quantified with a thing called phase locking factor. Now phase locking factor is effectively a measure of, of how consistent the phase of the oscillation is uh, across the trials. And we can see this synchrony here in the beta band. See, this is at 20 cycles a second, 20 hertz. So that's a, a, a beta band uh, signal. And uh, this is occurring a, about 100 milliseconds before the button press. Similarly, we see uh, activity down in the uh, around 40 hertz, and that's in the gamma band. So we've got beta band activity, gamma band activity preceding the button press. That's from this electrode. If we move a little bit further laterally, uh, uh, a bit further out from the midline, then we see a similar thing. Although here, uh, as you go a little bit more laterally, the beta is less prominent and the and the gamma is a bit more prominent, but it's essentially a very similar picture. After the press, you can actually see here, both at this site and at this site, uh, we've got a, a decrease in the amount of synchrony. Blue denotes a decrease in the amount of synchrony. So the, the main features that I want you to focus on, first of all, this big increase in syn synchrony in beta and gamma, uh, and the subsequent decrease in synchrony, of, again, about 100 milliseconds after the, the button press. This is data from healthy people. They studied 23 healthy people, and they studied 23 people with schizophrenia. I was saying only 25 with schizophrenia, uh, but similar number, slightly more. Uh, and uh, we see that, uh, that if we look in this, uh, the corresponding spot, here, uh, uh, overlying the motor cortex, just before the button press, we do not see synchronization, we see loss of synchronicity. And then at this point, we see the opposite, we actually see an increase. And you can see some lot similar things if you look at the different, uh, well, uh, these more lateral electrode sites. And uh, also, if we look down in the, in the gamma band, again, we see the opposite thing happening in the patient compared to the uh, healthy controls. Uh, furthermore, the, the, this abnormality of the beta signal, the, the abnormality here, uh, is correlated to the severity of what they describe as negative symptoms. Now, indeed, they were negative symptoms assessed with a rating scale called the scale for the assessment of negative symptoms. But that scale actually includes quite a lot of disorganization features as well. So although they do report it as negative symptoms, it's really a mixture of negative and disorganized uh, features. So what does this tell us? It, it, first of all, this 
blob here and this blob tell us that before the actual button press occur, the brain has generated, well, you could say generated a model of what's going to happen. And it's predicted that something's going to happen in the, in the relevant area of motor cortex. And this prediction is going to be, if you like, compared with the signals that do come into the, to the motor, uh, well, the sensory motor cortex, both the area, well, the, the hand area of sensory motor cortex, which is around the central sulcus um, in the left hemisphere. Uh, and uh, furthermore, they showed, well, they showed that this effect here and this effect here in the, in the gamma did predict the size of the event related potential after the button press. So in other words, by sending this predictive signal, it actually switched off the sensory response to the incoming information. Effectively, the brain said, you're going to predict, we're going to predict something here. So don't be surprised. You don't need to make any adjustments because you've done what you're meant to do. Uh, whereas on the other hand, uh, if you, uh, if you uh, don't make the correct prediction, then you, you're, you're likely to have to do more processing of the signal. It's an, it's an unexpected uh, signal has arrived uh, in your uh, sensory motor cortex and you need to uh, in a, well, in this task, you don't need to adjust because you're not getting a chance to correct it. You've pressed your button, but it's effectively told you what you did then, uh, well, that you didn't quite predict what was going to happen. Okay, so the really important thing then is this is an illustration of, if you like, the predictive signal that the brain has sent, both in the beta and the gamma, uh, and it really is completely different in schizophrenia. Okay, so that's... Uh, <coughs> work from Judith Ford's lab. Now I'll show you some work from our own lab also on focusing on beta oscillations. Now we're using a different task. We're doing a, uh, well, a button press in response to a simple sensory stimulus. So the person sees a visual stimulus and then they have to press a button when there's a change in the visual stimulus. Now what happens before the uh, onset well before the movement the, the movement is at time zero let me try the point here the movement is there what's happening in this area is going to if you like be confounded by the fact that we're presenting a sensory uh, uh, stimulus uh, whereas in judith ford's data they weren't but if we look at what happens around the time of the button press you see that blue uh, color representing uh, decreased activity also this is not the the phase synchronization. This is the actual amount of electrical activity, uh, and uh, then, uh, and but then we see about nearly a second later, you know, about 800, 900 milliseconds later, we've got this big burst of beta, which was that wasn't even seen in Ford's study because they didn't well they didn't present the data for what was happening that much after the button press, uh, but a lot of studies show that you do get this rebound of beta, and it's known as post movement beta rebound. Uh, so that's a, a well, uh, well, a, well a, a frequently observed phenomenon following motor, simple motor actions in various circumstances. And uh, uh, what our group has shown, and we've now shown this in at least three completely separate cohorts of patients, the, the magnitude of this post-movement beta rebound is reduced in schizophrenia. So there's less of the bright yellow color here than there was here. Also note here in this plot, frequency goes up. Uh, we're still at 20 hertz, but frequency in the previous plot I showed you from Ford's lab, uh, it, you know, the, the low frequencies were down low in the, in the picture. But uh, just to emphasize, we're still talking at 20 hertz here. Okay, now uh, various people, including Tan and colleagues from Oxford, uh, have uh, examined this, this beta rebound phenomenon uh, where, under various different circumstances where they've adjusted the, the participant's confidence in their action. What they actually do is they get the person moving, a, well, effectively moving a joystick, moving a cursor on a screen, but they interfere with the feedback to, so, but or at least the connection between the the joystick and the and the movement of the cursor. So the person gets uh, effectively uh, finds that the cursor doesn't do quite what they thought. So they lose confidence in the ex execution of their action. And what uh, uh, Tan et al have concluded that the magnitude of PMBR 
reflects uh, confidence. You know, when you're confident, you you actually carried out what you meant to do. Uh, then you get a big beta rebound. And so we are seeing uh, a reduction in schizophrenia. And so we'd suggest that that it, it, well, in some sense, it means the patients have a loss of confidence in the in the predictions uh, that guide their action. Furthermore, we found in, in several studies uh, that the degree of the reduction is correlated with severity of the disorganization symptoms I've been talking about. So again, we've got a, a pointer towards uh, these beta oscillations being in some way uh, related uh, to uh, the disorganization phenomenon. Okay, now the story is even, well, I think even more interesting insofar as those, uh, the sort of increase in, in beta activity measured in time average data, averaging across you know, multiple trials of the task, uh, actually consists of very transient bursts. And so the trial average data affects, a, a, if you like, the summation of a probability distribution of transient bursts of beta oscillations. And uh, uh, so uh, if you see here, for example, uh, this again, we've got frequency going from five to 35 hertz. So this is around the 18 hertz level here. And uh, in fact, the time axis here is, is, is arbitrary. That doesn't really matter. What you see at particular points during your task, uh, you see little bursts, quite transient bursts, lasting, well, uh, 100 milliseconds or so uh, of this uh, uh, transient burst of beta activity. If you look at the time course of the electrical signal along, you know, we're doing a time course along that particular frequency level, uh, you'll see something like this. So lots of fluctuations, but there's a fairly characteristic pattern. Now, at first sight, you may say that doesn't look terribly characteristic, but these little bursts always look like this, a, a, a sort of an upgoing signal, a downgoing signal, another upgoing signal, and possibly the further little wings extending slightly further out. So we've effectively got a little, uh, well, a little wavelet. For those of you who do wavelet analysis, they will, yeah, this roughly looks like a, 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 a wavelet, of, um, let's say a more wavelet approximately. So, uh, so these are uh, beta bursts. Now, if we now go back to data in uh, that visual motor task, actually, this is, well, this is not the visual motor task. It's another task that involves a motor response. And for the moment, we'll just say this involved a motor response. Uh, and what we see is following the motor response at about a second after the response, we've got this greatly increased frequency of beta bursts in the healthy people, but that is dramatically decreased in the patients with schizophrenia. Uh, and uh, so, and here we, well, I'm calling the, the uh, rate of beta bursts here, the, the, uh, is the post movement beta rebound measured in bursts per second. And uh, it's, uh, and C means controls uh, and P is patients. And so there's a significant reduction. Uh, so post movement burst probabilities decrease in schizophrenia, which is really another way of saying what I showed in the previous slide that, that the post movement beta rebound has decreased. Uh, but again, the burst probability is negatively correlated with disorganization. The more disorganized the patients, the less likely they are to produce a burst. Um, now, the other thing to say about this, oh, I, now I'm not sure that, okay, now I think I've just got something on my screen that you probably can't see, but I'm pointing here to a reference to work by Spitzer and Hagens, who, who've done a detailed examination of the uh, of what these beta bursts uh, represent in terms of brain function. And uh, Spitzer and Hagens have concluded that beta bursts are associated with the activation of latent contents of working memory, stuff that's being held in your working memory it is in a latent form uh, so that the you know the neurons are not actually firing but the transmembrane potentials are near the point of firing within a network that's representing the content of of working memory now you could say in the context of predictive coding you know the predictive code of what you're going to do is some it, it's the content of working memory it's being maintained in your in your working memory over a second or more maybe longer uh, and so you could easily extrapolate from Spitzer and Hagen's notion uh, that uh, beta bursts will also be to do with the actual um, uh, making active the the predict of uh, the prediction regarding the state of the brain as you uh, execute 
a, a movement. And uh, uh, with my colleague Paul Briley and other members of our team, uh, we did a study to investigate this, uh, uh, which was published last year. And I'll sh actually show you some of, the, some of the findings on the next slide. So <clears throat> first of all, uh, we found that in healthy individuals, well, in both healthy individuals and in patients with schizophrenia, we examined the brain activity measured with functional magnetic resonance imaging. This is the so-called bold signal uh, that you measure in fMRI. And we're uh, measuring the, br the brain activity associated with the occurrence of beta bursts. So effectively, we look, we do a, a regression equation predicting brain activity uh, in, uh, in the period following uh, the occurrence of a beta burst. And uh, we find certain areas of the brain where uh, there is uh, uh, fMRI signal, bold signal, uh, uh, apparently, if you like, triggered by, or I won't say that implies cause, I'll just say associated with. As for what causes, you know, causality is a more tricky thing to prove. Uh, so, uh, beta bursts were associated with activity in what I'm describing as content specific brain regions and suppressing of competing activity. Now, the justification for that statement, what the people were supposed to be doing here was in fact uh, pr uh, processing um, letters of the alphabet uh, and, and making a button press in response to these. And the sort of areas of the brain that are involved in the articulation of letter. You imagine the person internally articulating the letter, let's say the letter X or the letter B or whatever, uh, and and uh, starting to prepare a, a an articulation and a button press associated with this. And what we see is bold, positive bold signal in superior temporal gyrus and here in, in, well, this is the sort of pharynx area of the sensory motor cortex. Uh, and so this is the area that would be involved in, uh, if you like, preparing to articulate a letter of the alphabet. We also saw effects higher up here in the motor cortex that are just not shown in this, this set of slices. Um, okay, so this is content specific brain regions are activated. We also saw that other ongoing brain activity was switched off. Now, um, um, well, I won't go into all the details of that, but the, in part of the time during this task, people were doing a, an executive processing task that would have involved engaging the, the uh, lateral frontal cortex and probably areas in the uh, intraparietal sulcus of the temporal lobe. Uh, and we actually saw a suppression of that competing activity. So in other words, the beta burst switch off the content specific brain regions and they suppress competing uh, activity. Now, in schizophrenia, the brain activation is more extensive than it was in patients. You'll remember I showed you on the previous slide that the patients produce fewer beta bursts, but nonetheless, the activation associated with each beta burst is more extensive. And so what we're seeing here, the yellow colors represent the areas of activation associated with the uh, um, uh, sorry, yes, the, oh, sorry, the yellow is in patients and the red colors are in controls and the orange is the overlap between the two. But so the first thing really to emphasize if we look at, at the controls first, the healthy controls, these uh, orange areas are really pretty much the same areas you saw here, although it does extend right up here into bilateral uh, motor cortex a little bit, well, just simply not visible in, in this set of slices, but some are up about there. Uh, and uh, but a little bit more lateral than that slice uh, shows. And uh, but what we see in the patients, we see much more extensive activation in these well motor cortex and extending forward into premotor cortex. We also see activity down here in the cerebellum, which is also part of if like the motor system. So in other words, there's, there's, uh, the patients are showing uh, much more extensive act. act Activity and the extent of activation is again correlated with severity of disorganization. So the tentative interpretation we would offer is that um, the patients are, uh, uh, if you like, making their predictive coding in a less precise manner. They're, they're preparing to engage far more of the brain than, they, than the healthy controls 
uh, do. The healthy controls have got this fairly contained activity in the area concerned with articulation of letters of the alphabet, whereas the patients are doing much more all over the place, um, or not absolutely all over the place, but because they are largely motor areas or areas related to motor activity. So, uh, so it does appear that, that, well, we not, it does appear. Our interpretation is that uh, patients with schizophrenia, and especially those with severe disorganization, uh, have imprecise predictive coding. So that's about predicting what is going to happen, the content of your prediction, uh, whether you're predicting articulating a speech sound or whether you're uh, uh, predicting a more, uh, well, a more global activation of the, of, the, of the motor system. But there's another important aspect of prediction, and that is predicting when things will occur. You remember from what I showed when I showed uh, Judith Ford's uh, data during the self-generated task that uh, you know the the actual uh, what I was calling the predictive signal was occurring between well at about a hundred milliseconds before the uh, expected action, well, before the observed action. Now, uh, Anna Allen and Giro uh, Mamesier have uh, uh, done a very nice review in Trends in Cognitive Sciences a few years ago, that's a decade ago now, uh, of uh, this process of predictive uh, timing. So by predictive timing, they mean minimizing uncertainty about when events are, uh, will occur. And if you can minimize this uncertainty, then that will facilitate the detection and processing of, of the, the events. Uh, and and there's, you know, they assemble in their review a, a body of evidence showing that, that the more accurately you can predict when, uh, then the, the more efficient the detection and processing of incoming signals. And uh, they, uh, Arnal and uh, colleagues also note that uh, uh, many biological signals exhibit quasi-period periodic modulation on a time scale between a tenth and, and one second, uh, which makes them predictable. Now, when I say many biological signals, probably the best illustration I'm presenting to you right now, which is human speech, where syllables are occurring, let's say, two or three hundred milliseconds apart. And so as I'm articulating words, you can your ability to make sense of what I'm saying is really very strongly helped by the fact that you can predict when I begin each syllable. And the linguists, or the, well, people who do the uh, neuroscience of, of language uh, can demonstrate that you, know, you really get a lot of information from knowing when I'm going to start the next syllable, so to speak. And these, you know, I start a new syllable about every two or 300 milliseconds. So, uh, so this is an example of what they mean by uh, many biological signals have this quasi-periodic modulation. You know, it's not like the regular musical notes that I depicted in the mismatch ne negativity example I discussed earlier on in this presentation. So this suggests then that, uh, or what Arnal and colleagues have proposed, is that, uh, that the prediction of when predominantly involves low frequency oscillations in the, the delta or theta range. Delta is sort of one cycle per second up to four cycles a second. Theta is from four up to eight or nine cycles per second. So in other words, embracing uh, this time scale. And so what Anal uh, proposes is predicting when uh, is involves these low frequency delta and theta oscillations, whereas predicting what entails gamma and beta. That's what I illustrated, for example, in the data from, uh, from Judith Ford's lab in the self-paced uh, finger uh, button presses. Okay, so that's the concept of predictive timing. Now, uh, my team was quite keen to try to uh, understand, uh, is there imprecise timing in schizophrenia? And uh, now we and we did this using an auditory oddball task. In the in the auditory oddball task, we had occasional high frequency target tones uh, occurring in a train of low frequency non target tones. So a bit like the mismatch negativity uh, uh, paradigm that I showed earlier, except that here the the odd the you know, the oddballs are actual targets. You're supposed to press a, either count them or press a button. We have people pressing a button in this study. Uh, now the underlying notion, if you like, based on the sort of evidence that Anal and others have examined, is that 
predictive signals will modulate the processing of these auditory uh, uh, signals. And we would expect that the ongoing, uh, uh, the phase of the slow ongoing oscillations down in the delta or theta uh, band will somehow contribute to the event-related electrical activity uh, after the uh, actual uh, uh, stimulus of interest has arrived. So what we've got here, controls, patients, and the difference between controls and patients, there are uh, 34 in each group here. And I'm showing you, first of all, the event-related electrical potentials. Uh, so, and the dark lines here, the continuous dark lines, represent the uh, uh, electrical potential uh, recorded at electrode CZ. So that's sort of over the vertex midline, uh, roughly at the highest point on the head. And, uh, and what you see is in healthy people, you see uh, a series of fluctuations. Uh, you know, this is the, the P2, the N2, the uh, P3. They're, they're, well, they're labeled P and N, depending on whether they're positive going or negative going. And uh, uh, they, they, you know, have, well, conventionally labeled as things like M2, P3, et cetera. And this is the P3. It also goes around 300 milliseconds, so it's sometimes called the P300. And uh, it's, it's reduced in patients. That's well established. This has been studied for 40 or 50 years. It's one of the most robust findings in schizophrenia research. And the difference between controls and patients, you see this N2, P3 complex where the, the, this signal uh, to do with detecting oddballs uh, is uh, it's reduced in patients compared to controls. Okay, now we were interested in the timing uh, and the notion uh, that Arnal and others would propose is that uh, there's, there's some predictive signal that is occurring before the, uh, uh, the target. Now I should also say here the signals, whether they were targets or non-targets, occur once every two seconds. So people did have a pretty good idea when they were going to receive a signal. They were making some prediction about what was going to happen when the signal arrived. Uh, and uh, so we might anticipate that if low frequency delta or theta oscillations are somehow timing the prep, well, preparing for what's going to happen, that uh, we would expect that, that there will be, that there will be a sort of a setting or a resetting of the phase of the ongoing oscillations in a way that, that contributes to the event rate of potential. Anyway, that was the prediction and uh, uh, various people, including Martinez Montes, have developed a, a statistic that that uh, they call T phase, which is effectively the degree of phase resetting uh, that occurs in this sort of task. Uh, broadly speaking, they, uh, they remove the so-called uh, evoked signal, the consistent evoked signal from the electrical signal, and they uh, examine the phase relationship between what's happening in the baseline period before the imperative stimulus arrives and, uh, uh, and the phase of this residual signal after removing the evoked signal. Uh, uh, they examine the phase relationship with the preceding baseline signal. And so that's, the that's a, a measure of the degree of phase resetting and there's this statistic called the T phase. Now, we examine this in, in the, in the you know, patients and controls generating this data. We analyze these electrical signals according to Martinez Monte's procedure. Uh, and we look for phase resetting both in the delta band, that's one to four hertz, theta band, uh, four to eight hertz we selected. And what you can see, healthy individuals, uh, well, now the, the, the lighter blue represents a, an increase in the phase resetting. You can see some phase resetting both in delta and in theta, a little bit more prominent in delta than in theta. Uh, and it's occurring, roughly speaking, around this N2, well, the N2 P3 window, which, or, you know, this window here where we've got a, 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 a marked difference between uh, controls and patients. Now, in the patients, in fact, what was happening in the theta band wasn't all that different from what was happening in the controls. But uh, the, the patients show absolutely no evidence of this phase uh, resetting in the delta band. And when we do the controls minus patients different and we measure a pseudo T statistic, effectively that was the difference in controls and patients divided by a measure of the variance. So I won't go into the details, but it's, it's a equivalent to it or similar to a T statistic required to use to assess the uh, probability of uh, observed data. And, uh, uh, and so we get a, a, a significant 
uh, difference between controls and patients. And furthermore, the magnitude of this uh, uh, deficit in phase resetting is associated with disorganisation. So a negative correlation between the amount of phase uh, resetting and disorganisation. That was not massively large, but minus 0.35 correlation. And, and in this size sample, that was significant. Okay, so that's, so that's we interpret this as imprecise suggesting imprecise timing in schizophrenia and furthermore you're getting used to the term now disorganization is the feature that most strongly predicts that right that was some work we did some years ago with Kat, well Katrin Berger was my PhD student at the time we did that work anyway more recently with Paul Briley who's another colleague well he's a colleague working in our lab now we wanted to examine the relationship between phase of delta oscillations and the timing of beta bursts because we were predicting in light of those notions about slow frequencies predicting when and beta predicting what we would expect to see that beta bursts would occur at a particular phase of delta. Now, before I actually discuss this uh, data, which does show the relationship between delta phase and time of burst, I'll point out another interesting feature. This was uh, data acquired during a visual go no go task. So the participants saw uh, letters, uh, they saw either an X or a K on the screen, presented once every two seconds, and uh, uh, the uh, for the Xs they were uh, expected to press a button to go, and uh, on the Ks they were expected to no goes, uh, to not go, and uh, the no go stimuli were relatively rare, so people made a reasonable number of mistakes. It's sort of moderately difficult to do this without occasionally making a mistake. Now, what happens is when you make a mistake, you tend to go slower on the next trial. And that's, you know, that's what's called post-error slowing. It, it seems to be an adaptive response. And what uh, that, you know, that we, that we normally make, healthy people make this adaptive response after they make mistakes. We slow down and we're a bit more careful on the next trial. Now, what we've got here is the reaction time to a go stimulus on the subsequent trial when, uh, uh, when there had either been a burst on the preceding trial, in other words, a burst, a beta burst was present, or no beta burst on the preceding trial. So in other words, a beta burst in association with the error, and, and there wasn't a beta burst. And what we see here, the reaction time is much greater. The, the dotted line here, these represent the, well, these are errors. To, to have a, a go on a no-go trial is an error. So these are the error trials. And where there's been an error on the previous trial, then the reaction time is much slower on the subsequent go trial. Uh, and that, you know, that effect is greatly enhanced by the presence of a beta burst. So it does look like the presence of a beta burst is associated with a much more, uh, uh, well, a much more effective adaptive response that slows you down and minimizes the risk of making the same mistake twice. Now, what about phase of beta burst? Now, what I'm showing you here, first of all, in healthy controls and also in schizophrenia patients, I'm simply showing you the relationship between the phase of the underlying delta signal when beta bursts occur. Uh, uh, this is beta, well, beta bursts occur following button presses. And what you can see is that in healthy people, the beta bursts are much more likely to occur in a quite narrow range of the, the phase. I mean, effectively, you know, the beta signal, this is zero phase, and we go around here to, to pi and then back around to zero again. And so this, you know, in this third quadrant between minus pi and, and uh, minus pi up and two, we've got a, a, a real clustering across subjects. Also, uh, th this effect is quite strong. Well, I'm not showing you the, the degree of clustering. Within each subject, you can measure the degree of clustering. And across subjects, you can show the similarity between subjects of the, the phase of the, of the delta. So delta phase seems to play a big part in determining the timing of the beta burst. In patients, across subjects, because each blue circle here represents an individual person. There's much less clustering in a particular phase. There's a bit of a tendency to cluster down here in the third quadrant, but there's much more variation across subjects. And if we look at the statistic that measures how clustered they were, the patients showed within subjects significantly less clustering. 
So they were they were less likely to cluster at the same at a particular phase of delta, and the degree of clustering was much more variable trial to trial in schizophrenia. Now, oops, I'm going too fast here. Um, so uh, now we we still I mean it's speculative as to what this really means. I would say you know, it suggests though that delta phase does uh, which we're arguing is something about predicting when things are going to occur and beta bursts, which is somehow associated with what's occurring, that these, that the phase of delta does predict the probability of beta bursts uh, and, uh, uh, and that this relationship is, is disrupted in, in schizophrenia and indeed again related to disorganization. So the bottom line here is that we've got accumulating evidence that there is imprecision not only of what is predicted, represented by the extent of mold activation that I showed you a few slides ago, and also imprecision in the timing. Okay, now uh, I've got to keep a bit of an eye on time because I want to wrap up now in a minute or so. Uh, so, uh, but I just want to, uh, well, uh, quickly cover a few issues to do with, with uh, neuromodulators, dopamine and acetylcholine. These are neurotransmitters that I think are intimately involved in predictive coding. Now, uh, as you might know, dopamine neurons in the midbrain predict project from the midbrain to the basal ganglia, which are deep gray matter structures, and also to the frontal cortex. And that dopamine plays a role in modulating this teaching signal arising from prediction errors, adjusting what's happening in the, well, in the predictive areas of the brain uh, uh, following a prediction error. So dopamine is involved in that. Now, I can't discuss all the evidence for that right now, uh, but dopamine plays a role. Uh, and then acetylcholine, that's the transmitter of the so-called parasympathetic nervous system. In the periphery, uh, the signals are carried via the vagus nerve to the heart and other uh, organs in the body. Uh, and But also it's the uh, transmitter in the so-called central autonomic network. Now, it well, it's important for a number of things, very important for general health, uh, but uh, uh, in particular, it plays a cardinal role in orienting to stimuli. In other words, selecting the appropriate uh, brain circuit to deal with what's happening, the incoming stimuli and and uh, and uh, ignoring what's irrelevant so it, it promotes contextually appropriate endogenous influences while inhibiting irrelevant endogenous influences and by a contextually appropriate endogenous uh, influence i'd regard something like post error slowing as an illustration of a uh, a contextually appropriate influence based on well prediction from the previous trial. And uh, uh, so biperidin, which is a, 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 a drug that blocks acetylcholine, can be used for treating Parkinson's disease. And it's also used for treating the Parkinsonian side effects of antipsychotics in, in schizophrenia. Anyway, this abolishes post-error slowing. And it also abolishes another phenomenon, which is called post error resistance to interference in a in a thing called the Simon task. Now that's a, a task where you frequently have interference between sensory signals from one hemisphere and motor action uh, in the contralateral uh, uh, motor cortex. I don't need to go into the details, but the bottom is bottom line is it's a task where uh, you've got Inter potential interference from unhelpful information and uh, uh, and uh, by paradin uh, uh, you know, abolishes that process uh, uh, by antagonism of, of acetylcholine. Now, uh, just uh, flipping back quickly to dopamine, uh, as you said, prediction errors are associated with the release of dopamine. That's the underlying notion that dopamine carries the teaching signal. Uh, and we've just said that in schizophrenia, where we've uh, uh, that we're going to get frequent prediction errors due to imprecise prediction that might lead to an excessive amount of dopamine uh, and indeed that well there is an inverse relationship between beta oscillations and presynaptic dopamine which would you know lead well support this notion that prediction errors will lead to excess dopamine uh, and uh, there's now quite a lot of evidence uh, um, that increased presynaptic dopamine is associated with transient florid psychosis including delusions and hallucinations so what this would suggest that these what i'm calling the classical features of disorganization and perhaps the negative symptoms uh, uh, we predict that they cause frequent prediction errors decreased beta oscillations increased presynaptic dopamine and therefore 
risk of episodes of uh, of uh, delusions and hallucinations. So that's where dopamine comes into mediating relationship between this imposition and coding and uh, the risk of uh, of uh, delusions and hallucinations. Uh, now, a similarly quick skate over the autonomic nervous system. Now, uh, broadly speaking, anticipated attention is is accompanied by vaguely mediated heart rate deceleration. You know, imagine a cat watching a mouse hole waiting for the mouse to pop out. And that when the cat is sort of there uh, anticipating, its heart slows. And, and we are also, our heart slows when we're anticipating a, a relevant uh, stimulus that we have to react to. And uh, so cardiac deceleration, which is mediated by the vagus nerve, this acetylcholine carrying nerve, uh, is associated with faster reaction time, indicating a close coupling between what we're calling predictive coding processes. Whoops, we're just skating on too quickly. And and the autonomic responsivity. And in schizophrenia, underactivity of the vagus is well established as it's associated with disorganization of mental activity. Not surprising I was going to say that at this point. Okay, so where are we going? So uh, where what's the what's the if you like the anatomy of the acetylcholine projections? Uh, they, there's acetylcholine nuclei in the brainstem, but also in an area called the basal nucleus of minor. This is a, a coronal slice, a slice sort of, as my hand currently indicates, uh, and this is at the level of the anterior commissure, for those of you who are familiar with brain slices. This is sort of front parts of the temporal lobe, uh, and uh, so uh, we've got the basal nucleus of minor here, which uh, is a, a diffuse area of, of brain matter where the nuclei can uh, contain a lot of acetylcholine neurons and they project to and they will receive and send information to the frontal cortex they send off information all over the brain and the main issue here is that they project widely in the cortex and they can promote the well they they are at least anatomically set up to promote the processing of relevant stimuli according if you like to what the prefrontal cortex might might predict and uh, uh, and then, but you can get quite complex effects because you've got different sorts of receptors, muscarinic receptors and nicotinic receptors. So you've got the possibility of quite uh, intricate and complex interactions. Uh, but broadly speaking, stimulation of the basal, basal nucleus promotes the beta oscillations that we've been focusing on. So uh, that brings me more or less to the end. Uh, I've put all this in front of you because what I... Uh, well, what I look forward to mathematicians doing is developing better models of these processes so that we can understand what's happening in, in schizophrenia. And, uh, you know, the models need to include local circuits and the long range connections. And I, early on in this presentation, I referred to the work of Adams on the mismatch negativity. They had these local circuits and they had the long range things. They didn't attempt to put the neuromodulators into the circuit. Now, that's fine. You can't put everything in your model. You shouldn't try to put everything in your model. But in light of what I've said in the final couple of minutes about the importance of the uh, dopamine and acetylcholine in psychotic illness, then, uh, you know, I think it, it would really be good to ha allow, you know, adjustment of, if you like, modulation of the strengths, either of these connections or maybe of these connections. So uh, uh, there we are. That's the, that's the story. Uh, there are many people that I've worked with over the past, well, what I've described was my 45 year adventure that started when I was a medical student working with Tim Crow. Uh, and uh, this is my wife, Elizabeth, who's, uh, well, uh, contributed lots of interesting ideas over the last several decades, but my various other colleagues, uh, uh, you know, at Hammersmith Hospital, uh, well, in Canada, and then again, more locally, my team here in Nottingham. So uh, uh, there we are. I hope that's been of some interest. Uh, first of all, thanks for the presentation. It was so interesting for me, and I believe for Claudia and Galvis as well. It has so much to do with what we are working nowadays. and. Since I was asked to make straightforward questions, I, I just like to to know if you uh, somehow explore the dynamics between these all all these these bands of the EEG, because I, I I think that we have the mu rhythm that is associated with the motor response, and we have the beta that you show that has to do with uh, 
this predicted coding and the delta and this just kind of jumps out of the screen when you are presenting. So I think it's a, a, a good way uh, to know a little bit more by modeling the relation between these these bands and not necessarily modeling the the circuitry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I certainly agree. And of course, you're probably aware that people have discussed, well, cross frequency interactions, particularly the phase of lower frequencies modulating the, the amplitude of, of higher frequencies. And so, you know, various, well, there's quite a lot of empirical work describing that. Uh, now, um, or much as I would love myself to do some modeling, as I said at the beginning, it's uh, uh, 45 or 50 years since I would have had any competence myself to really develop such models. So, uh, uh, and so, uh, and, and I must admit, I'm also not really familiar with all of the things that other mathematicians might have done in trying to model these interactions. But there's no doubt, there's a, you know, a lot of observational evidence that there are these uh, interactions between the low frequencies and the high frequencies. And uh, I hope I've uh, put evidence in front of you today to, to suggest that these interactions are very important in linking what the predictions of when with what. And, uh, and so, uh, so certainly it's material, it, you know, I, I would love to see good models of that sort of interaction. And I guess I'd like to see models that use data from both healthy people and, uh, and patients and, uh, and try to model, um, you know, model the, uh, well, model the abnormalities as well as the, the uh, healthy patterns. So I, I, I... Well, I have lots of questions to tell you about uh, what we're doing, but we'll do it next week. But something you said remind me a paper wrote by Claudia and Daniel Freiman, who is with us now. In, in this paper, they do the following. They, they uh, volunteers are exposed to, to a movie in which you could see a man walking. So the, 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 the figure of the man was already in the uh, always in the center of the scream and you could all only see the the articulations point so it mm -hmm. was a quite abstract figure but look yes. at it, you could be identified so yes. they presented the, uh, to the volunteers the original figure of the man walking and then uh, the same movie but in which the part had been scrambled all around yes mm -hmm. so it was uh, it was very strange you could not identify mm. that this was a hand and so on and then they they look at the interactions between they look at the eeg data uh, yes. the during exposition and then they try to to see if the correlation so they did it in a very clever way i don't want to give you the details but they saw the correlations to try to identify the interactions mm -hmm. uh, uh, among uh, um, among electrodes and yes. the, well, uh, the, the, obviously, uh, 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 there was a huge difference in the graph they obtained uh, from different volunteers mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, during the exposure to the, to the movie. But I think mm -hmm. it's quite robust. Mm -hmm. If I remember correctly, so, uh, if I remember correctly, um, uh, uh, people um, uh, at F7, at electrode F7, mm -hmm. there was always the degree of the graph was my, much higher when yes. the, uh, the scrambled figure. Mm -hmm. So, and then, well, so if I remember correctly, F7 was associated to distinguish between animal and non animal movement. Yes, okay. And it was a, a nice possible interpretation. So when you have something which is difficult to classify, mm -hmm. you, you require more regions of the brain to be involved. Mm -hmm. and this reminds me of something you said. Uh, brain activation is more extensive in schizophrenia. Do you yes. think same kind of um, mechanism? I, I guess so, but uh, I'd like to, to hear you coming mm -hmm. through this. Yes, well, I mean, quite clearly, uh, you know, we. Uh, Obviously, our predictions about biological motion are, you know, are quite sophisticated. You know, we're very good at identifying human movements, you know, and of course, social interaction depends on a, a great deal of 
detail in, in what we uh, predict about how people will move, etc. So it's therefore not surprising that you're going to see, you know, a, a coherent pattern of information. Not surprising that uh, left frontal cortex might be playing a particular part, although I would expect that there be, you know, interactions, uh, well, coherence with many other areas as well. Uh, now, uh, it and so it'd be very well your question i think is related to what might i predict in schizophrenia now um and of course the people with schizophrenia are more likely to have trouble in predicting well they're they're less good at predicting what happens in social interactions than i i guess they were well in fact i know they are less good also at if you like interpreting biological motion the motion of stick figures as, as you described so uh, so i'm going to expect uh, if you like probably less synchronized activity. Um, and it's important to note when talking, when comparing EG signals to uh, bold signals, because bold fMRI signals measure the amount of brain activity, even if it's poorly synchronized, whereas EG really only picks up synchronized activity. So on the whole, I would predict that you'll see, if you like, less activity, in less synchronized activity in schizophrenia. There'll be more extent, there may be more extensive bold activation, but the bold activation will represent brain activity irrespective of how well synchronized it was to the movements. So I guess I'm not quite sure I'm answering your question as you might have hoped, but, but I would be definitely predicting less synchronization in schizophrenia and possibly you know globally or even locally over frontal cortex uh, there'll be less synchronization in, in the schizophrenia cases compared to the controls but if we were to do uh, well if we were to do concurrent eg bold which is what we've done although it is a fiendishly difficult technique you're putting electrodes in a three tesla magnet you know if you can imagine just the person moves a small amount and you generate electromotive forces that are many millivolts whereas brain you know generates microvolts of signals so so you know that's a whole uh, another technical uh, challenge but uh, but the bottom line is my prediction will be in what you've described is in general you'll see less synchronized activity in the eeg and you'll see uh, probably um, more evidence of uh, well of diffuse activity possibly in the wrong places or the unexpected places in the brain and so on so that'd be my prediction uh, now can you do that without being able to do bold uh, um, eg well that, that that's tricky because i mean any of the electrophysiological measures whether it's um, uh, whether it's eg or, or meg magnetoencephalography uh, do depend on synchronization but of course there are questions like now I talked about phase resetting, the thing that we measured using Martinez Monte's uh, well procedure for determining phase, well, how the phase of the preceding delta predicts uh, predicts what will happen after an imperative stimulus. So I suppose you know uh, somehow within all of that uh, you know, massive information that you that you will be acquiring with EEG, you conceivably could. Uh, examine something to do with the degree to which um, uh, you know low frequency phase immediately prior to what should have been some if you like uh, informative movement you know imagine this stick figure suddenly raises its hand or it does something important uh, socially important let's say uh, then uh, then we might expect the patients would fail to show much if you like use of the predictive signal so right at the minute in in the scrambled picture you know clearly you've got less prediction going on uh, as for studying you know prediction of individual salient movements then then clearly i guess there's more to be done by looking at the details of the of what's actually happening on the uh, with these figures on the screen Okay, thank you. So maybe the author of the paper want to comment on that. Thank you very much. What is really specific about schizophrenia in in, in this error prediction? Yep. Yeah. Well, now, I, first of all, you may be aware that 
many, uh, well, many neuropsychiatric conditions uh, are likely to involve uh, problems with, with prediction. And in particular, uh, you know, uh, there are uh, accounts of delusions or hallucinations, even in schizophrenia, that are based on a uh, mismatch of either the, well, the sensory information versus the prediction, but uh, where the actual predictions might be quite precise. So the, the first answer to your question, what is specific about the disorganization syndrome that I'm saying predicts poor long-term function, then I would say it's the imprecision. Now, of course, you're going, I would expect that other conditions will have imprecision. And I've pointed to the role of acetylcholine, for example, in, uh, well, in predictive coding, in orienting and related predictive processes. And, uh, uh, and of course, you, you may be aware in Alzheimer's disease, uh, there is degeneration of the basal nucleus of minor, there's degeneration of those kind of neurotic fibers. So I would certainly have to accept that in, uh, in uh, conditions that involve degeneration of the cholinergic system, we're almost certainly going to get imprecise coding as well. So I'm not giving you an, a, an adequate answer when I say it's uh, uh, imprecise coding alone, although I would say, of course, the, the really striking difference between Alzheimer's and schizophrenia is Alzheimer's is an inexorably progressive disorder, you know, over the course, well, although it actually can build up very slowly once it becomes an overt illness over the matter of a few years the person deteriorates very dramatically and also uh, particularly of course uh, well memory function now memory is impaired in schizophrenia as well but it is more in the executive processes so uh, the best answer i can give to your question i would be definitely arguing the thing that i'm interested in in disorganization is imprecision as opposed to mismatch between prediction and sensory signals uh, that might cause some other phenomena uh, and as for the difference between uh, you know, degenerations like Alzheimer's or frontotemporal dementia also, uh, then I'd have to argue the time course is a really striking feature, uh, but also probably you know, the particular circuits that, that, are, uh, you know, that are caught up in this. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, now, particularly, I mean, we've done a lot of work on the, the insula, you know, sort of deep in from where I'm pointing here, the grey matter that's buried behind the temporal poles. Uh, and uh, that uh, area plays a great deal of, uh, well, a very important role in so-called salience detection, amalgamating incoming information from the multiple senses, et cetera. And, and if, if identifying in a sense what is salient and and assisting in the recruitment of the appropriate circles circuits now i believe in schizophrenia that that the uh, the insular is especially involved and there's a lot of reasons i argue that uh, uh partly from evidence of structural changes but other things as well uh, whereas for example in alzheimer's uh, it starts in the medial temporal lobe in frontotemporal dementia it starts here uh, and so uh, so I, I i so again the long but uh, speculative answer to your question is both the time course and the particular circuits that are most implicated okay thank you very much so at, at first when you discuss uh, predictive coding you said that the brain is generating internal models from the environment here we would describe this this as the brain selecting a possible model from a class of models, yes. uh, which and I would say one of our most interesting questions to us is which is this class of models that the brains choose from. Yes. Um, I was hoping that maybe the data and behavior of the, uh, the patients could help us shed some light on what this model class is. So for example, in the phase uh, uh, graph you showed, the the phase of the slow oscillations was really uniform closer to more was more uniformly distributed across yes. the the healthy the space do you believe that's usually the case the the behavior of different participants is uniform across the possibilities of the behaviors or are there are specific ways in the in in the way they their behavior is different from the uh, known schizophrenic yeah. people now now at the moment 
quite simply, I can't give a good answer to that question. Uh, I mean, definitely, uh, well, at the moment, I really want to say there's evidence that's both the prediction of when and the prediction of what. And so I'm really already allowing myself a pretty wide range, if you like, of, of aspects of the model. Uh, as for, you know, what do you mean by class of model? Well, I, I suppose I could ask you to say a little bit more about what you mean by class of model, but, but broadly speaking, uh, well, okay. Well, maybe I should ask you, when, when you use the word classes of model, what, can you give me an illustration of what you mean by different classes of model? Well, yes, for example, when we work with uh, uh, sequence learning, structural learning sequences, yes. we have different models of the information the participant uses to predict in the next step in the sequence. Yes. So, for example, in our case, the whole possible, we use a particular model, for example, to give a more form, formal framework for what to do, yes. in which you use a class of models called context tree models, which is a mm -hmm. formal description. And we assume that the brain is uh, selecting a model, for example, from this class. Yes. So we have a class of, uh, of descriptions, and he chooses being the number of parameters. The parameters mm -hmm. will make, uh, when he fixes it, uh, as he approximates the parameters of the number of parameters, he's choosing a yes. model from the class. Yes. The ones that minimizes, for example, the, the errors, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea is what's the class or what the possible descriptions that the brain yes. can internalize from the exterior. That's what the type of thing that we are trying to formalize. One of the yeah. things we're working on. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I'm not sure. I, I mean, certainly I can't uh, you know, formulate classes in terms of, well, mathematical descriptions. Um, uh, I mean, clearly, uh, in terms of what people with schizophrenia, the way they've developed their knowledge of the world and therefore their predictions, they definitely make less use of past regularity in the, you know, in 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 things that happen in the world. So they're less influenced by by previous regularity. Uh, so there's there's no. It seems to me that you know healthy prediction is very much based on on. The prediction of regularity you know as, as i was saying anal and colleagues have emphasized the importance of uh, well uh, the reason they postulated that low frequency delta and theta oscillations matter is is this notion that that the sort of predictive models that they are envisaging uh, are models in which an important feature is is regularity over time but you know what what i'm talking about as class of models may not be what 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 you've got in mind no i think it's it's somewhat the same thing the, the, i think this answered my question thank you thank you everybody thank you for the discussion and i look forward to continue to have discussions with uh, well, this group of people